that Alcoholics Anonymous recognizes a special relationship which it enjoys with Al-Anon family groups, a separate but similar fellowship, and be it further resolved that Alcoholics Anonymous wishes to recognize and hereby, hereby does recognize the great contribution which the Al-Anon family groups have made and are making in assisting the families of alcoholics everywhere. April 24th, 1969. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia. Hi, Julia. Catch the Wave is my home group. Waikiki, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., come and join us. I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. I'm reading the resolution of gratitude from Al-Anon family groups to Alcoholics Anonymous. Whereas the World Service Conference of Al-Anon family groups on behalf of the Al-Anon Fellowship, which includes Alateen, acknowledges a debt of gratitude to Alcoholics Anonymous for the special encouragement, guidance, and spiritual support that began with the formation of family groups and continues today in the ongoing cooperation between Al-Anon family groups and Alcoholics Anonymous worldwide for willingly sharing its three legacies, the steps, traditions, and concepts adapted by Al-Anon family groups, which serve to heal the families and friends of alcoholics for publishing family-related articles in the AA Grapevine both before and after Al-Anon family groups developed its own material. Therefore, be it resolved that it is the desire of the World Service Conference of Al-Anon family groups always to remember Al-Anon's roots in the inspiration, in the inspired program of Alcoholics Anonymous. May our special relationship continue to grow. Resolution adopted by the 30th World Service Conference of Al-Anon Family Groups, April 25th, 1990. And my name is Judy. I'm a very grateful member of Al-Anon Family Groups. I wanted to talk just a minute about Al-Anon today because we gave you a little history of years ago. Before many of us were here. But today, Aladon and Alateen can be found around the world. We have over 20,000 meetings registered in over 130 countries, and we span five continents. Nothing in the Arctic or Antarctica, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> 78 of those meetings are something new to many of us. They are called electronic meetings. They happen over the internet, they happen over the telephone. And they're in English, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, and we finally had one registered in Estonian. Today our literature is published in 42 languages, the latest being in Turkey, and can you believe there's over 60 meetings in Iran. That was chicken skin when I found that out. Our members are black, white, brown, red, and yellow, and every combination thereof. We are the wives, husbands, partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, mothers, fathers, grandparents, sisters, brothers, neighbors, employers, employee of someone who's drinking bothers us. What else can I say other than we have truly blessed and have the privilege of being a part of something those that came before us and gave so freely of themselves so that we can be a family, a family in recovery today. My Al-Anon service has taken me to many places around the world. I'm very fortunate to be able to have served Al-Anon at the uh, world level. During these travels, I get to meet a lot of Al-Anon and AA members. I also get to hear a lot about fascinating and creative ways members work out programs and carry our message. One of the most fascinating stories that I've heard come from the speaker's home state, Alaska. Our speaker's from Wasilla, Alaska. But most of you that sat at the table have found um, an Al-Anon faces alcoholism. We print this twice a year, and it's our greatest public outreach tool that we've ever had. I have given each one of you uh, one of these. I hope that you'll look at it and pass it on to a professional to help carry our message. And you'll also have a little book bar for you to keep yourself, so you pass that on. As you know, Alaska is very different from Hawaii in many ways. 
Alaska has a lot of open land with miles and miles of open spaces. Carrying our message, um, carrying our message to some of these places is beyond my comprehension. Several years ago, the Alaska Public Outreach Committee got a very creative and arranged for one of the Iditarod bushers to carry and deliver the al on faces alcoholism to all the villages along the way. Can you imagine? So you just never know. We don't miss an opportunity. <laughs> Being creative and dedicated seems to be our way. When I first met Sharon, our speaker, about four years ago at the World Service Conference in Virginia Beach, she showed me every year how creative she is and how dedicated she is to Al-Anon. Four years ago, the Alaska delegate resigned, and Sharon was lucky, the lucky alternate delegate that got to step, step up to the plate. Thank you, Sharon. Being a dedicated Al-Anon member that she is, she made herself available to serve her very own term as the Alaska delegate. This year is her last, was her last year, the three-year term as uh, delegate. Sharon was selected by her peers at the World Service Conference to be one of the closing uh, spiritual speakers. After I heard her story, I knew we had to have her come to Hawaii. I give you Sharon. Sharon Brown and I'm a very grateful member of the Al-Anon family groups and my family is even more grateful that I'm still here with you this afternoon <laughs> you know I enjoy saying that because when I'm with you I get to go back home and I get to be a better mom you know um, I feel like I'm coming to the scene of the crime um, <laughs> I was here 25 years ago on my fourth wedding anniversary with my husband and I thought I killed him and so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, when we came 25 years ago, my husband was still drinking, and so he was not sober. And when we landed, I was very angry. Because apparently after I fell asleep, after having a glass of champagne or two, um, he kept on going to the stewardess and asking for more champagne, one for him and one for me, and I was already asleep. So by the time we landed, um, he was thoroughly... You know, <laughs> you know what they, those alcoholics do when they they drink a lot. And you know, when we were riding, we're riding in a limo to go to our hotel, and I am just, I'm, I'm steaming, I'm fuming, and I can't even look at him, and I can't even talk to him. And um, to make a short story, sort of why I thought I killed him is, we went out partying. You know, that's what you come and do when you're not in the program. You go, you tr I try to keep up with my husband and drink, which I don't know how to do that. Because I feel like I'm not an alcoholic today because I have to be in control at all times. <laughs> and when you drink to the way that they drink, it sure doesn't look like control. So I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> we were um, staying at the Miramar Hotel. And um, we were on the 14th floor, and after a night of partying, we went back to the hotel, and he decided to go out to the lanai and smoke a little something, which made me even angrier. So I locked it. <laughs> and we're from Alaska, and you know how warm it gets, and um, I thought maybe then he'll cool off or warm up or whatever he needs to do out there. So I tried to go back and lay down and, you know, waited maybe half an hour. And I thought, maybe he learned his lesson, so I go back out to the lanai, and um, I look out there, and he's nowhere to be seen. We're on the 14th floor. Where the heck did he go? And um, I started to panic, and I started looking over the ledge, and I don't see a body down there. I don't see anybody. And um, apparently when he couldn't, you know, he knee banged, and I heard him. I just ignored him. That's what I normally do with alcoholism. I ignore it in a stalking, silent <laughs> way. And um, apparently he jumped to the next lanai, and he was pounding on their door, and he didn't get anybody, so he jumped to the next lanai. We're on the 14th floor, mind you. And he's pounding on the door, 
And then the, peop- the previous people opened the doors. Security guard came, and my husband went in. And um, so that's what happened. By the time I went out there, he was gone. But I have alcoholic radar. I turn it on, and I find him. <laughs> he was... <laughs> I, this is true. If you ever go to your state fairs, you know how many people are there. I turn on my alcoholic radar, beep, 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 and I can find you guys. <laughs> but I really have one for my husband. So I found him. He was asleep, trying to sleep in the parking garage where our car was parked, and I had to bang on the door and make him come home. And, of course, I was successful. <laughs> so it's nice to actually come to Hawaii sober. I have a sober husband today, and he's been sober for 22 years, and I'm so grateful for that. I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska, and um, that's where my family was from, and that's where my mom and dad met. And I think I was about two years old when the 1964 earthquake hit. And, you know, when you're two, your world is kind of moving around and shaking, so you don't really know what's going on and to me that's just like alcoholism it's cunning it's baffling and it's all powerful you know I knew my world wasn't right but I sure couldn't tell you why and even at a young age I um my dad would get into fights he would come home all bloody bandaged he would get into car crashes he would um you know go and do what alcoholics do and he would come home and I am one um of a children of four, I'm the only girl, so that will tell you a little bit about me, and I have three brothers. I know how to, ha- I know how to hang out with the guys, <laughs> know how to fight with them, I know how to play with them, I know how to do things like that, but not girls, I, not yet at that time. Um, but I felt, even at a young, tender, tender age, my mom would try to keep us away from my dad when he was drinking and would come home like that. She was a very good al maybe a very sick one at that time. And um, I felt if I can run past my mom and go sit on my daddy's lap that I can make it okay. And when I was sitting there, I did feel like I can make it okay, and I made a difference. So I think I already had the disease at that age. (laughs) So that just kind of progressed. Um, I just will say very shortly in my high school years, I didn't do drugs, alcohol, or drink, or have sex, or any of those things that everybody else was doing because I had a relationship with my God at that time. So I did not need to do that. But I wanted to get out of, we did move to Kotzebue because that's where my dad's from, and Kotzebue is above the Arctic Circle. So it's even further up where Sarah Palin lives, because that's, have to say that too, but I don't know her. <laughs> and, um, yes. <laughs> and, um, I had to immediately go to college, and I graduated in three years, and I had to get out of there and go to high school. I had to live or do something. And that's where I met my husband, my husband to be. And you know those alcoholics are always a moving and a shaking, and you you just I just want to I'm so gravitated to them, and I was very attracted, and I'm like, oh, I'm in love. <laughs> you know how we met is um, he knocked on I think we met in we met in the choir where you have to separate and go boy girl boy girl boy girl. So I picked the two cutest guys in the room and plopped to myself right there. And he invited me to go to um, a restaurant and have some pizza and have a wine cooler or something like that. And I said, sure. And the way he got me there is he borrowed his brother's car, but his brother had to drive, and it was only a two-seater. And I'm thinking, where am I going to sit? So I sat on the in-between on this hard thing, and I'm thinking, boy, what kind of date is this? This guy takes his brother with him. What's up with that? Um, And then when we got back to our dorm room, he said, let's go meet my roommate and go to my room. And we do that. And then he lets me meet his roommate. And then he's the one that leaves. And he starts walking the hallways. And I'm like, this guy is trying to kiss me, but I want to kiss that guy out there. How do I make that guy come be right here? 
So I spent a long time doing that, um, and I apparently it worked because he's right here. <laughs> we have now been married for 29 years this year, and it's all due to the grace of Alco- um, Alcoholics Anonymous and um, Al-Anon. And I want to go back, and I want to thank Judy for asking me to submit my spiritual talk, and I want to thank Carolyn for asking me to speak, Carolyn and the committee to ask me to speak here at this conference. And I am very honored and privileged to be here, so thank you. I wanted to get that out of the way before I forgot. Um, so thank you. I, I just This is humbling. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share your story in rooms like these. So immediately we start um, doing what we do. You know, I, I want to be in a relationship with this man, and I want to get married, and I want to have children. And, you know, we started doing that, and I found out I was eight months pregnant when I found out. Um, let, let me go back. I was four months pregnant when I found out I was pregnant. And we had to get married. I had to get married. He had to get married. But in his religion, you have to have permission from both parents. And my dad said no. He absolutely said no. Maybe he knew he was an alcoholic and he can recognize an alcoholic, so he said no. (laughs) Um, But I worked on him, wrote a 10-page letter, and he finally said yes, because by that time I was eight months pregnant and I was pregnant with identical twin boys. So they were born, and so here they are. We're having kids in this disease called alcoholism. He would be out all night. He drank at the bars. Do you know why? Because I was at home. He couldn't drink at home. I was there. So he had to go away from me and drink in the bars and not come home. And I'm the type of Al-Anon that if I want you somewhere, I'm going to go find you and make you be there. So I would wake up in the middle of the night or I would be staying up till 2 a.m. and um, trying to call the bars and make them come home, and he wouldn't, of course. So I would get madder and madder, and I would have to pack myself up, two little boys, twin boys under each arm, and go to these bars and try to drag them out of there. And sometimes he would listen and sometimes he wouldn't. Then I would go home very angry, and um, it just progressed and progressed and progressed and progressed. And I don't know what puts this in our minds, us Al-Anon women, that if we think maybe if I have another child, then maybe he'll be the father I want and the husband I want, and maybe he'll come home, and maybe he'll be a part of my life, and maybe, maybe this time he will do what I want. So we have another, uh, those twins were Anthony and Jerry. And then three days, three years later, we have a daughter named Shauna. And she's born develop- developmentally delayed, and she has seizures. And she later on had to be tube fed and things like that. And he's still not coming home. And I'm getting crazier and angrier and just I can't stand it anymore. And what happens when I was pregnant with her and two little boys, I would still go out. At that time, he would be in the crack houses, and he would be gone for three days. And I did not like this at all, and I was going to make him come home. And like I said, I have that alcoholic radar, and I turn it on, and here he is. He parked his car five blocks away from where the crack house was, but I can still find it. And I go pounding and banging on the doors, and um, all the crack ho- crackheads are in there, and they're hiding, and, oh, my God, that woman's here. <laughs> and I am pregnant, two little boys, but they're most afraid of me. They're the ones in the crack houses with the guns and the knives and things like that, but they're afraid of me. They look at my husband, you need to go, you're 86 out of the crack houses. That woman is scary, you need to take her and go home. <laughs> That will let you know what kind of disease I have. I will bowl you over. I'm a tiger. I will get what I want, and I don't care what happens by doing that. So that's the type of person I am. You know, I was talking to somebody about um, what's the difference between a Rottweiler and an Al-Anon. Lipstick. (laughs) I'm that kind of Al-Anon. I'm, I'm that sick. And yes, I believe I'm sicker 
than the alcoholic because I'm doing everything sober. And um, they're, they have some release and I don't have any. <laughs> and alcohol doesn't work for me, so I didn't get that release. So I don't know how, you know, we take a victim is how we get our release because then we think we're in control, we think we know what we're doing, and we, we have a plan. And I had a lot of plans and they just didn't work. And um, so finally, my husband does get sober because he sees our little girl having seizures for the first time, and she was five months old. And um, something clicked in him. You know, what that thing that happens to alcoholics when they finally stop and they get that aha moment and they, they realize they want to do something or they need to do something, and God, God helps them in that, at that moment, and I'm so grateful for that. And that's what happened to us. And he got sober. And um, but that doesn't mean our family got happy, joyous, and free. I I was still very sick because I did not have Al-Anon. I went into Al-Anon when he first got sober, but I I didn't stay. I thought I don't know what's wrong with these people. They're they're talking about being powerless in their meetings, and and they're you know they just. Didn't, it didn't seem right to me because what do they mean they're powerless over this or that or the alcoholic or the alcohol? And I'm looking at them and thinking in my mind, what wimps? <laughs> they just don't know how to assert themselves and they don't know how to get it done. So I'm out of here. <laughs> and that's what I did. I didn't. I thought that's what you know, Al-Anon was. So I left and I did not stay in. So you can imagine two people. With no, I didn't have a recovery. He had sobriety. He was sober. But I believe at that time he did not have recovery. He kind of slowly weaned himself from AA, and we both got very sick. The disease of Al-Anon is, if I am in contact with an alcoholic and I don't do anything different, I get spiritually sick right along with them. Anger attracts anger. Resentment attracts resentment. And, you know, to me, I also like to say sickness attracts sickness. So here we are, very, very sick, trying to raise children. We have three at this time, and um, it's World War III in our home every day. I can't even look at this man anymore. I can't even talk to this man anymore, and I'm starting to hate him. I hated to love him. I loved to hate him. And I, I was in this vicious, vicious, vicious circle. And I finally got to get to, um, to a place where I'm sad, lonely, depressed, miserable, angry, fed up to here. I can't take it anymore. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So what I did one of the times, and, you know, we always have these stories. We're always going home, going to mom and dad. They would always send me plane tickets, and I would always go home to Kotzebue. And we, I would go and leave, and then I'd come because I'd miss them, and I'd have to come back. And, and in one of these times, um, he made me very angry. And uh, when he left to go visit his brother, I packed the whole house. Everything. I took the TV, the beds, everything. I even took the washer and dryer. I took it all. And he comes back home to an empty house. (laughs) And his wife and kids are gone. And um, it's it's just, and at that time, the identical twin boys, they were starting to get in their stuff. They were starting to smoke some things, and they were starting to drink and do those things. And so our house is getting very chaotic and crazy and and, and a miserable place to be. I did not want to be home. And so that continues for a while until I just can't take it anymore. And then he, we just have these big fights every day, arguing and yelling, you know, two people trying to control each other. It's, it's, it's an ugly place to live. And finally, he goes back to AA, and I felt like Lois did those darn meetings. <laughs> I think she said another word, but um, I felt that way because he started going to those meetings nightly and started hanging out with who knows what, and I and I felt so weird, and I felt so left behind, and I felt so alone. I felt more alone, and he kept on going to those darn meetings because I think his sponsor at the time asked him to go to four meetings a week, and I thought, you were never home when you were drinking. You see, now you're never home when you're trying to not drink. What's the problem? 
So I was still very angry, and I finally had to tell him, you need to pick AA or me. I put my hands on my hip, and I said, if it's not going to be me, then you need to marry AA. And that's what I told him. And so I was still very angry. And so, you know, thank God he had a sponsor and he was trying to do what that sponsor was asking him to do. And his sponsor suggested to him, hey, ask your wife to go to an Al-Anon meeting. And I don't know what prompted my husband to do that, but that's what he did. And he said, hey, there's an Al-Anon meeting. Would you like to go? And I looked at him and if my eyes were daggers, he would be dead, that one of those kind of looks. But I don't know how I ended up in that Al-Anon meeting the next day because I was there. And I never listened to my husband. But that's the power of my God reaching into my life and yanking me where I needed to be. And I went to Al-Anon. And there was those people again talking about being powerless. <laughs> and I still kind of laughed. And you guys, what's your guys are crazy. I still felt that way. And... But then they were laughing and they were smiling and they were joking and, and I thought, that's what I want. That's what I needed. But I didn't know how to get it. And at that time, the, you know, the Al Anon meetings I was attending, nobody talked about sponsors in those Al Anon meetings, those early Al Anon meetings I went to. It was actually in the AA rooms that I had a few alcoholics <laughs> that would always ask me, did you get a sponsor? Do you have a sponsor? Do you have a sponsor? Every time they saw me, they asked me that question. So pretty soon I started getting a resentment. <laughs> if they ask me one more time. <laughs> so finally I thought, okay, what is this sponsor thing? How do I go about getting one? And I didn't know how about how to get one. They didn't really say talk about them in Al-Anon at that time. And um, finally someone said, go ask someone you're attracted to. Go to somebody that you like their recovery, you like what it looks like, and they're going to help you get what they have. And I thought, oh, I can do this. And um, at that time, grateful for my husband's sponsor at that time, he asked him to go to some outside conferences. We got to go to um, some in Montana. We got to go to other ones and just be a part of those. And, and that's where I found my first sponsor that I wanted to work with. I had a couple sponsors before that. My first one, I had to talk her into being my sponsor, so that didn't work. The next one said, I know you know steps one, two, and three. Let's start on four. And I knew that quite quite wouldn't work but when I finally found the one she was always surrounded by a lot of women and she was very um, I liked her recovery and I wanted what she had but I was afraid to go up to her and ask her to be my sponsor because I thought if She's too busy with all these other people. How is she going to have time for me? And, you know, I'm still thinking maybe I have no value. I'm less than, you know, how we, we always think this in here. When we get a sponsor, oh, I can't call them and take up their time or I can't, I can't do this. I, I'm going to take them away from their home or their children. You know, I felt all those things. And I'll tell you right now, that's just not the case. You know, I, I sponsor women today and I'm so grateful for that. And they never take my time away from my children or my family. My family may say that because I had my, one of my sons really said, Mom, you always have time for those al but you never have time for me. But, you know, it's just to say, listen and acknowledge and say, I hear you. I have some time next, the next day. Will that work for you? So I get to learn how to speak that way to my children. But I wanted the sponsor, so I finally went and asked her, and of course she said yes. And we started working the steps, and we started getting into recovery, and she helped me recover from this disease. At that time, my oldest um, identical twin boy, Anthony, he was really doing, working on his story. He, you know, if he was, he was just really working on it way too good. <laughs> um, I thought if he had a God, a sponsor, and a program, then he would be okay. Isn't that good thinking, right? Don't we all want that for our children? You know, if there's some parents in here that have children or grandkids, that's what we want. A God, a sponsor, and a program, and, you know, that would be okay. But I had to give up that best thinking. 
and I had to get God's better. And um, I will just say I had some weird feelings about this kid, about this boy named Anthony. That was my oldest identical twin boy. He would walk in front of me, and I would think, if I ever lost a kid, it would be him. And as a mom, I'm thinking, how dare I think that? How could I think that? But it it was in those instances that God was trying to prepare me for something. Because what happened to that that kid, he would drink, he would drive. He would drink, he would fight. He would drink, he would get into trouble. So, of course, he would go to jail. Drink and go to jail. Drink and go to jail. Drink and go to jail. And we didn't, my husband and I didn't know any better. We would bail him out and try to help him, and we'd bail him out, and bail him out, and bail him out, and bail him out. I even went and did being a third party. You know, we always have to do what we think we need to do here, even though we're in recovery. The logic of Al-Anon told me eventually, because my sponsor kind of knocked on my head and said, doing the same thing over and over is insanity. Bailing him out is insane, because he just gets more alcoholic-related charges. But the logic of my heart and my head were fighting with each other. The things you guys said in Al-Anon made sense. Think of Tradition 1. Our common welfare should come first. Personal progress for the greatest number depends upon unity. I had to think of my husband. I had to think of my other children. And um, at that time... Also, we had another son. He was born into sobriety, and his name is Gabriel. So I'm so grateful he did not have to see the very ugly me. And um, I have to say at this time, too, I also spanked those twin boys, because that's what my mom did. So I spanked them. But I'm very grateful to say I never had to spank Gabe, because you guys taught me that I did not have to do that, and I'm so grateful for that. But what ends ends up happening, finally, what my sponsor is trying to say to me, it starts to sink in. Don't bail them out anymore. But something in my heart tells me it's not going to be good if you don't bail them out. And the logic of Al-Anon in my head saying, this is the right thing to do. You know, we had to, my husband and I had to come to a decision and actually kick him out. We had to say, I'm sorry, in our home, we can't have any alcohol, we can't have any drugs, and we can't have you coming home here in our home like this. You can go ahead and drink, because we're powerless over that, but in our home, we're going to have to say no alcohol and no drugs. You're welcome in our home if you are sober. And that was one of the hardest things for me to do, because after that happened, he was homeless. And he's homeless, living on the streets of Wasilla. And when I go to town, I see him by the laundromat. He's just out there sitting. And you know how that tugs at our heart when it's our children. When it's our children, it's something different. When it was my husband, I'm thinking, my husband's all grown up. He can kind of fend for himself. But then when it comes to our children, we as mothers, we feel so responsible. We, we are, we, it's almost like we be over responsible, over protective, over, you know, we just do it too much. And so thankful for a very strong sponsor because her voice was louder than my head. And I need that kind of sponsor because when I'm in my stuff, I need to be able to hear her. And she, she said, it's not a good idea to bail him out. So I listened and Not too long after that, we got, you know, three troopers came to our door. And, of course, I thought in my mind, oh, my God, Anthony committed suicide. Because God was preparing me for that. I think maybe a week before he killed himself, you know, there were some ropes in our backyard, and I asked my husband to take them down. It's almost like I knew where God was trying to prepare me, and that's what my God does today. He prepares me for what's going to come. If I stay here with you, I need to be here with you, I need to perform his work well, and I need to do what he asked me to do. And in the beginning, 
that was hard because I don't I don't want to be uncomfortable and I don't want to do things that are too difficult. And what was difficult to me in that time was going to three meetings a week, calling my sponsor, doing all that you do here, work in the steps and things like that. I, um, with that handicapped child at home, I thought, I can't leave her. I have to be home with her. I have to be a good mom and I have to take care of her. That's my disease lying to me, saying I needed to be somewhere else. But I, and I struggled with getting those babysitters and I like to bring this up because I took a lot of risks for alcoholism. Loading my pregnant self and my kids and going to the crack houses. That's crazy. I would never do that today. Staying up in the middle of the night and waiting for him to come home, that's crazy. So when I come to a conference and I'm getting low on sleep, you know what? I can get a little amount of sleep for recovery. Because God's going to fill me with his power and strength to be here to do what I need to be doing. And, you know, when I wanted to go out drinking and dancing with my husband, I got those doggone sitters. So why can't I get those doggone sitters for my meetings? And I have to remember that because I don't know why we get here and recover and we start thinking, I don't have to go. I don't have to go to the meeting. Oh, that meeting's too early. I'm not going to the beach meeting or I'm not going to stay up and go to that meeting. That's too late. I have to remember I stayed up late. I got little sleep in the disease of alcoholism. So I want to be remember that and bring that into my recovery program today. So I still go to three meetings a week, and I still have that handicapped child, but God provides what I need when I stay here with you. So getting back to that son that killed himself, you know, it's just, it was devastating. And I got mad at that sponsor for for me listening to her, because I'm thinking, well, if I didn't listen to you, my son wouldn't be dead. Because, you know, the thing is, when we have sponsors, we always have a choice to take their guidance and direction, or we don't. We always have that choice. Some of us want to think we don't (laughs) have that choice, but we always have that choice. When I was stuck in the disease of alcoholism, I felt I had no choices. In Al-Anon, I do. And I had to work more steps regarding that because I was mad at my sponsor and I was very mad at God because I trusted God. Because my sponsor taught me every night when that son was out on the streets, give him to God, put him in your hands and give him to God's hands every night and say, thy will be done. I did not want to pray that prayer because that meant I was giving God permission to do what he wanted. And that's a very scary place to be for moms or dads. Or grandparents, when we have to learn to surrender them, it's very scary because then we don't, we're surrendering to an unknown. And I know me, I need to know. I need to know what's going to happen. And I, I had to say prayers like, God, please remove my need to know. Because you guys always told me in the meetings, you will know what you need to know when you know it. You'll find out when you need to know. And I'm like, that doesn't drive you crazy not knowing what you're doing or what they're doing? And you guys would say, no. (laughs) And I was like, what's wrong? (laughs) There's something wrong still here. (laughs) But I had to learn how to do those things because I was practicing the disease over and over and over and over. So I had to learn how to practice a solution, and you guys gave that to me. And it was different and hard in the beginning, but I learned how to do that because I... did listen to my sponsor, and I do. I did what she asked me to do, and so, you know, we bury that son. And my husband was only a year sober that that time. I thought, oh my God, he's gonna drink. Then I worried about that for a while, because you know we still do the things we do, even in recovery, until we finally get tired of doing them. But my husband did not drink. For because of the grace of God. And he was able to bury, he buried his one-year medallion with him. And that, wow, that that was amazing. And for me to bury my eldest son. But you know what the greatest gift I got when that happened 
was all the alcoholics were there. The people that, you know, my my husband's sponsor, all that group on that Thursday night meeting when my son died, they came and brought the meeting to us. I did not have Alan on then, but at least those alcoholics were there, and I love listening to the alcoholics. because so I need to be reminded how they feel. You know, I was in some meetings and some alcoholics were sharing and they were sharing about how they feel. They feel less than. They feel the horror and the remorse and they feel like they just can't be loved and they don't measure up and they, they want our love. They want us al to love them. But us al because we're sick, we don't know how to love them until we get here and start doing what we do here. And, you know, when my alcoholic is most unlovable, it's hard for me to love him. I do this to him. I squish him. My sponsor asked me, you know, are you, do you like doing that? I said, no. She had to teach me how to be nice. And how I was nice in the beginning, I had to just keep my mouth shut. And for somebody who thinks that they know everything and I need to tell you, right? We do that in al We need to tell you. We want to tell you. And I had to not do that. And I had to put duct tape. Over. In Alaska, we use duct tape. <laughs> I had to use duct tape because what would come out of my mouth comes out 100 miles a minute and duct tape, it can stay on even in a 100 mile an hour wind. So I had to imagine doing that, and I had to learn how to be nice. And in the beginning, being nice was just keep my mouth shut. Don't say a word. And I'm one of those moms, when those kids are fighting with their dad, I like to get in the middle, get in the middle, get in the middle. Quit doing that, quit doing that, quit doing that, quit doing that. So I want them to have a good relationship. You know, we, us Alamans, we always want them to be, have, we want good things. But we don't know how to have good things. And I had to quit forcing them, and I had to quit forcing that solution. And I'm so grateful for I don't have to do that. And in the beginning, I had to get out of the house. My sponsor said, walk around the house when that's happening. And there have been some times when they were in fights, but I had to walk around the house, walk around the house, walk around the house. And I did that. And lo and behold, I was able to detach from their fights and and not have to get into them. You know, what is my recovery like today? I have to say that other identical twin boy, he has been in and out of jail since his twin died. He's in jail currently. And it's been 10 years this year since we lost Anthony. And Anthony was only 18 when he committed suicide. And I really have to thank Carolyn Because this summer when she called, it was the day of when my son Jerry went back to jail. And what happened on that day, I got a call from the troopers. And I'm I'm not liking calls from the troopers. (laughs) Even in recovery, I'm not liking calls from the troopers because the first thing that comes to my mind is fear. But thank God, you know, it doesn't mean we get here and we never are afraid. It means we get here, we start doing what we do here, and we work the steps, and we learn how to take care of our fear. I still feel fear today, but I have a solution to it. I immediately drop to my knees. God, help me be what I need to be in this moment and do what I need to do. And I got up, and I felt filled with God's power and strength. And I did what the troopers asked me to do, and they told me they found him unresponsive by the side of the road, and the EMTs were called. And they had to do some kind of chest stimulations to revive him, and I found out later that my son tried to commit suicide, the other son, the other twin. He tried to overdose on some drugs. But when Carolyn called and asked me to speak here, after... Getting what I needed to do, I went back home, and I was feeling, whoa. I didn't immediately go crazy or, you know, do the things we normally do. I was, I was almost like I was at peace. 
and that I could be okay. And I went and I Googled online the uh, conference, and the conference theme was, This Too Shall Pass. That was a direct conversation from God to me saying, This Too Shall Pass. That gave me the greatest comfort and peace that I could ever have in my life. And I thought, you know what? Yes, my son tried to take himself out but I don't have to go out with him. That's what Al-Anon has done for me. You know, in the last um, last year, we lost, uh, my dad passed away last year, last August, and I heard somebody just lose somebody in August. Two days later, my husband lost his mom. And um, I'm so grateful for what Al-Anon has taught me because I got to suit up and show up before my dad died. He got medevaced down from Kotzebue, which is an hour and a half jet ride to Anchorage, the biggest city in Alaska. And I got to go drive an hour there and an hour back to be with them. Unfortunately, I knew I was watching my dad die. But you guys taught me yet again, you suit up, you show up, you go there. Even though it's too difficult or you feel uncomfortable, you go, you go, you go. There were times I was getting so tired I could barely drive there. But I thought, you know, you guys taught me how to do that. Go do something that's too difficult. So I was able to show up and be there for my dad. Unfortunately, in some of those times, my al kicked in. Because when they weren't discharging him properly or forgetting this or forgetting that and going to the assisted living homes and they just took out things that weren't supposed to be out and we had to put them back in, I became a discharge care coordinator. And then I tried to manage that until my sponsor said to me, because I I share with what's in my head today with her. And if I didn't share that, she wouldn't have been able to say to me, Sharon, it sounds like you're a discharge care coordinator and not a daughter. And I'm like, oh, you're right. And then we laugh. And then I can get back to doing what I need to do. But... I will tell you my disease can still progress because later on I was Sharon D. Brown, MD. <laughs> so then I really had to detach. And when my dad died, I, my al still kicked my butt. I had to work the steps yet again. And I had to do 1 through 12 with my dad. And I found out in that instance, my sponsor wanted me to do a four-step inventory. And I thought, why am I doing that? I already, you know, I already went to Kotzebue and I made those face-to-face amends the first time I did the steps. Why am I doing another inventory? My dad passed away. What's, what's the inventory? I'm clean with him. I made those amends. There's, you know, I felt, all I felt was a tremendous loss and a tremendous pain because my dad was gone. And then by doing that inventory, and I love that sponsors are persistent Because what I found out was, when I did that inventory and I shared it with her, what I found out was I was placing, this is how I felt, I was losing the only man in this world that loved me unconditionally. Because he was always there for me. He provided money, he provided tickets, he provided anything I needed. And what I didn't realize is I was wrapping around some security around my dad which should have been wrapped around God. And when I did that inventory, it opened my eyes to if I put somebody else in God's spot. When I'm there, or my husband's there, or my children are there, I'm in trouble. Then I'm managing again, and I'm in a lot of trouble. So that just opened my eyes. And, you know, by doing that, I'm a lot freer today. I'm a lot freer to live, to actually live. Because before you guys, I was just surviving and living in chaos and living in the problem. And today what my life looks like is I get to not, I don't have to do that. And I love going to meetings and I love talking. When I'm in a a meeting, I have to remember that there's newcomers in the meetings. And I'm so grateful for the people that were there when I went into the meetings. You guys were there. You were there. And I have to always remember that because there are some times when I'm too tired to go to a meeting or I don't feel like it. 
And I'm very grateful my feet were trained early in the beginning. They said, go to meetings, even though you don't feel like it, even though you don't want to, even though you don't want to face people. And I just have to tell you, before Al-Anon, I dressed in sweats, top and bottom, didn't wear makeup, didn't care how I looked because I felt worthless. But Al-Anon has brought to my life something very, very incredible. I actually love the woman Al-Anon has taught me to be today. I love looking in, I love who's looking at me in a mirror. Because there was a time I did not like that person. That alcoholism had taken me to. It was a mean, ugly person that attacked before she got hurt. And I don't have to live that way today anymore. And it's just incredible. And I love my husband even more today. And we're still together because of AA and because of Al-Anon. And I'm so grateful for to those people. You know, they have taught me how to be okay no matter what happens. My son is in jail and he's in God's hands and that's where he needs to stay. You know, there, I'm also a grandma. I have to say that. My grandson is nine years old this year, but unfortunately I I haven't seen him in the last four years, and I'm so grateful that you guys have taught me to live where I need to live. Just right now I don't have a relationship with him, and I'm okay not knowing where he is, what he's doing, because I I don't know where he is, but I know that God knows where he is, and God is taking care of him. When I take care of him, then I want to see him. I want to know where he is, what he's doing. How come I don't get to see him? Then I want to go to the courthouse and file a grandparent's rights. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking out for what I need and what I want and what I think I deserve and what I think you guys need to pay me, I'm in trouble. I had to learn to let go of those things and just be what God wants me to be and to do what God wants me to be. And sometimes it's not always easy. And what my recovery has brought me to, I don't try to live in a right or wrong anymore or a left or a right or, you know, because sometimes we always say let's do the right action, but sometimes it doesn't feel right. It didn't feel right leaving that kid in jail. But that was the spiritual action to do. So I try to live in the spiritual action. Not in the right or wrong or the left and right. The spiritual action. And how I got the spiritual action is is just surrendering. Giving wholly my life to this program. And yes, I can say no if I'm otherwise busy or can't make it, but I've always been taught to say yes. Because you guys were there and said yes to me. And I'm so grateful for that, and I love my life today. I walk confidently in the woman you guys have taught me to be, so thank you.